I mean, it is a quite an occasion to mark 75 years, first of all, because, uh, you know, in 1949, when NATO was founded, uh, this was certainly unprecedented for the United States to form this peacetime alliance, uh, given uh, the history of the United States and the admonition by George Washington in his farewell address uh, not to uh, join permanent alliances. And uh, I don't think the founders would have really expected this alliance would still be needed. Uh, 75 years later, or that it would have grown so much. Uh, and I think that's the the first thing to note for this summit, as you mentioned, Asla. I mean, you know, this was 12 countries, the US, Canada, and 10 European countries in, in 1949. And we are at 32 now with the addition of Sweden and Finland, also something that would have been hard to expect given the history of those countries. So uh, certainly, um, we come into this summit uh, with a lot of things that NATO has reason to be proud of, the importance of the institution for the security of its members. Uh, and as you said, it is overshadowed by this horrific war by Russia against Ukraine and the need to support Ukraine. And I think first and foremost, I'll be looking for what is being said about Ukraine and the continued support for the country uh, and the uh, the question of how the NATO members move beyond what they said last year regarding future Ukrainian membership to try to say something a little stronger uh, about Ukraine's future uh, in NATO and more broadly in the Euro-Atlantic community. Second thing, of course, is this question of the, uh, the how the how the NATO leaders look given the political crosswinds. Uh, President Biden is the host. Lots of questions raised at the at the at the debate last Thursday uh, uh, about him, and uh, I think we will be looking to see uh, what how he looks, how he sounds, uh, and I'll leave it to Tar to talk about President Macron, but he certainly comes in uh, much less strong uh, than uh, one might have expected uh, when this summit was first announced. Uh, and I think that the, the the standing of the leaders, the elections now bet between now and next week in the UK uh, and a change in government there, uh, there, there is certainly plenty uh, to look for uh, as we go into this summit. Constanza, let me turn to you. Um, when we were debating what title to have, you finally, you were the one that came up with old and bold. So... Uh, it's only appropriate that I tap into you to explain. And also, again, what will you be watching? Well, um, like, like Jim, I've been around long enough to remember several iterations of the theory that NATO is obsolete. Uh, when I started off my, my career as a young journalist 30 years ago, uh, my my section head and the political section would send me to social democratic party conferences where where the participants would demand that NATO be abolished and superseded, as I said, by the OSCE, which would be in future uh, the guardian of European security. Those were the days. Um, it was unimaginable then, right, because we all thought that we were heading for political entropy and everybody wanted to be like us and that Russia would want to be like us and the rest of the world would want to be like us and all of us would become liberal market democracies. End um, of history. End of history, exactly, Francis Fukuyama. Um, so I also you know, remember going a little further back even, um, going to law school in what was then the capital of, of West Germany in Bonn uh, in the midst of the massive anti-Pershing demonstrations. Uh, when NATO was very much still in the Cold War and um, it was a deterrence and, and defense alliance. And the reason I mention all this is that um, we have come full circle. I, I covered as a journalist NATO becoming an expeditionary alliance, uh, going first to the Balkans and then to Afghanistan, uh, sending missions to the maritime missions to the Horn of Africa. And now we are looking at an adversary um, who is attacking a, a, a large democratic country on the borders of Europe, Ukraine, um, and is interfering on a daily basis with, with cyber attacks, sabotage, espionage, and disinformation in the European political space, right? Um, the, most people will have heard by now of the 
the arson attack on a, a German armaments um, firm deal in, in, in on the outskirts of Berlin a few weeks ago. So, which is um, interestingly was attributed very, very quickly to the Russians by the German security services. So NATO and NATO's uh, original de defense and deterrence mission has taken on a wholly new urgency, not just because of Ukraine, not just because of the threats on Europe's periphery, but also because of what Russians and others are doing in terms of hybrid warfare within Europe. And so there is going to be a very, very real sense of urgency. And at the same time, as Jim said, a sense of self-questioning. Um, and that's, I think, the old part. Uh, the old part is not, not NATO at this point. It's that some of our leaders are looking pretty old. And um, and old either in the physical sense or in the sense that they have outstayed their political welcome, like the like the Tory leader Rishi Sunak in London. And I expect that we will have a new prime minister uh, in the UK joining us next week for the NATO summit. Yes, UK elections taking place uh, shortly and uh, expected to lead in a victory. Exactly. So, Tara, let me turn to you. Um, bring a European perspective into this. How are Europeans approaching next week's summit? Both Jim and Constanza have mentioned that people will be focusing on President Joe Biden as well. Is he uh, looking um, focused, is he energetic? What are how are other world leaders approaching him? But there are also other leaders uh, who are having political difficulties in their homeland. So on to you. Thanks a lot. Uh, very glad to be here. I have to say, being a French person living in DC and following both French and US politics right now is. Um, quite an experience. I don't know if I can recommend it to many people. It's it's a lot. It's a bit overwhelming. And you're right. I think uh, leaders will be scrutinized. And I'll get to um, how Emmanuel Macron will, will feature in this discussion in, in a minute. But I just want to say in terms of a European, larger European perspective, what we've seen is two additional European member states, uh, EU member states who've joined NATO, who've actually reinforce the alliance, strengthen the alliance. So we've seen actual NATO enlargement happening, um, mostly because of Russia's full-scale full invasion of Ukraine. And so there has been a form of dynamism in the alliance that we hadn't seen in a while. Macron was uh, uh, known also for having said that he thought NATO was brain dead. That was in 2019. I think we've seen a wholly different alliances then um, with a lot of political purpose. And there are many questions around the political cohesion of the alliance, the role that Hungary will play. In particular, Hungary has just taken over the presidency of the European Union Council um, with this motto, make Europe great again, which is uh, a paraphrase of Donald Trump's motto for America, make America great again. So we need to see how Europeans will, will come in. Will there be unity or fragmentation or diversity of views? I'm guessing it's going to be a bit of all that. Uh, many questions, of course, around US leadership and how US leadership will feature uh, in support for Ukraine in the coming months, because that question is really key. I think one of the main issues that will have to be settled at this summit is the future relationship of Ukraine with NATO. Uh, and we'll discuss this further on. Is it full membership, not membership, an invitation, this expression of the bridge? We've heard it uh, quite a lot. What does the bridge mean? Is it a bridge to NATO? Is it a bridge to a consolidation of Ukraine as a democracy? Uh, Secretary Blinken was at Brookings two days ago, and he discussed this publicly. The, the recording of his intervention is available online on our website. And, and what he referred to, he referred to additional air defense support um, but I thought it was interesting that he was explaining it as a way um, of consolidating Ukrainian uh, um, democracy, reconstructing Ukraine's economy. And so this was military support, but for a political and economic purpose. So I'm guessing we'll hear more of that next week. Let me just do one minute on Macron. I was not going to avoid it. Don't worry. <laughs> I have been trying to avoid it these past days because it, it's a bit um, overwhelming. I, I think as most of our viewers know, we are in um, the middle of two rounds of uh, snap parliamentary elections that were called because Emmanuel Macron dissolved the National Assembly on the evening of the results of the European elections, which were not favorable to his party. And so... 
the first round um his party did rather poorly his party did really bad in the european elections so um the rassemblement national the far right um got 32% of of the vote share and emmanuel macron's party came in second with 14.7% of the vote share so you know not even half uh, of what rassemblement national got and so he decided to dissolve the national assembly leading to snap elections his party did really badly in these snap elections, uh, the first round of which were held last Sunday. Uh, so now what we're seeing are basically three blocks uh, um, in the French political landscape, a far right, right wing block, a central block, um, basically led by Emmanuel Macron's party and the left and the far left together um, in a coalition. And Macron's party is the third block in this. The second round of the elections are happening this Sunday, uh, and it seems likely that his party will lose and that the far right is going to come in first. And so the question is, will they be in capacity to form a government with an absolute majority at the National Assembly or not? There are many questions around this. I won't get into it right now, but that's the main issue. If they do, they might be in capacity to form a government. I, I think that's highly unlikely considering the elections, uh, you know, we'll get the results of the elections on uh, Sunday evening and the NATO summit starts next Tuesday. But if they do get an absolute majority, Emmanuel Macron could actually find himself coming in with a far right um, foreign minister and defense minister who have totally antagonistic views to his in terms of support to Ukraine, so European support to Ukraine, NATO support to Ukraine. So we would see a totally bicephalic uh, French perspective, totally contradictory with no stability, little visibility in terms of who represents France and what France is going to do, which I think will be quite scary, both for European uh, and American allies. But the other option is that, and I think the most likely is that he will show up on his own with no foreign or defense minister because a government will not have had time to be formed. And then he'd actually also seem isolated. And a lot of the work and ideas that he's been putting forward for a stronger Europe might just, he won't be able to be the person embodying these ideas and fighting for them because of this isolation. Macron, of course, uh, one of the European leaders pushing for membership, NATO membership for Ukraine. So Michael, I want to turn to you and pivot back to Ukraine uh, and NATO. Uh, last year at the Vilnius summit, NATO summit in Vilnius, the big debate was, will Ukraine be a member of NATO? Will it be given a membership uh, perspective, membership action plan or not? And that's what the media, what media largely focused on. This year, we pretty much know that it will not have an official membership course. It is what uh, Tara and Jim and uh, Constanza talked about, a bridge, bridge being a, a concept, a bridge to mem membership. So um, I want to turn to you. Uh, it's not all doom and gloom. There is also commitment for security agreements with Ukraine and allocation of more funds from the Russian assets, 50 billion and so on. What will you be watching in next week's summit? And how does NATO fit into the whole equation when it comes to Ukraine uh, in your uh, understanding of the end game? Thanks, Asla. It's great to be with everybody. Well, let me say a couple of critical things about the summit, but then also some positive things I see happening and try to present a little bit of a balanced perspective as I see things. First of all, I would counsel our friends in government not to use the word celebration any more than they have to, to talk about this gathering. It doesn't feel like a moment for celebration when a war is ongoing in Europe, not to mention Gaza, not to mention a huge tragedy in Sudan, which is pretty close to NATO as well. And I don't like the term. I know what people mean by it in the sense that, of course, NATO is an amazing alliance and it's been very important for our security and it still is relevant and still is, as Constanza was saying, you know, reinvented in ways that are important and contribute substantially to our security. But I just don't like the term celebration when the world is facing what it's facing today. Second, I was at one of NATO's main organizational hubs two weeks ago in Rome, Italy at the NATO Defense College. And it was a good conversation, a good discussion, but some of the mood was, you know, why do we keep having these summits? NATO doesn't have a charter that requires an annual summit. 
Last year's, as you say, wound up being a fiasco in many ways. Luckily, most of the world doesn't pay that much attention to NATO summits, or at least most publics don't. And so the whole brouhaha over uh, President Zelensky being upset that he wasn't getting a clear path to membership was fairly quickly forgotten, I would hazard to guess, by most people except people like us. And uh, and so in one sense, there's no great harm done. But I don't see quite why we're forcing ourselves to come up with big new initiatives. You mentioned a bridge to membership. I mean, how many more metaphors are we going to use to talk about the fundamental reality, which is that we're not willing to commit? And so I find that conversation borderline useless, maybe even counterproductive. But let me now say a couple more positive things. We had General Eric Smith yesterday at Brookings, the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And even though his main focus, like many in the U.S. military, is on China, at least in terms of longer term preparations, he was quick to say that a lot of NATO allies are very interested in working with the Marines. You know, we're all trying to learn the lessons of the Ukraine war, but also benefit from this new energy in the alliance to strengthen the 32, make sure we can defend our own territory, uh, absorb now a stronger Nordic contingent, and also just make sure that that eastern flank is prepared against any kind of probing or other mischievous uh, behavior that Putin may contemplate in the future. And there is some positive energy in the alliance at a military planning level and a political level in that regard. Another point that I'm encouraged by is that I heard this at the NATO Defense College in conversation. I've heard it elsewhere at the Pentagon and other places recently. It does appear that the ground that Ukraine was losing through the spring, that that dynamic has been largely stanched, largely stymied. And uh, I think the 61 billion aid package from the Congress, overdue as it was, is beginning to help. Let me also give a big shout out to European allies in Canada, because as we've shown in our Ukraine index, they're actually doing more for Ukraine than the United States, even counting the 61 billion. Donald Trump was wrong about that in the debate. Europe is really coming through in a burden sharing way. And the combined effort of all of us is now again helping Ukraine stay on its feet. And the last point I'll make in that same regard, and this is related to an idea that Professor Lee Howard at Georgetown and I have been trying to develop over the last year and a half, thinking about alternative security architectures for Europe. And it also builds, in some ways, it relates to what President Macron has talked about with putting perhaps some NATO uh, troops on Ukrainian territory in a defensive mode. Lee's and I aren't necessarily advocating that, but we are thinking about having more Western forces or at least Western military personnel in uniform someday on Ukrainian soil as a potential alternative to, or maybe even a complement to, but we see it first and foremost as a potential alternative to NATO membership in a way that may make a longer term arrangement with Russia more negotiable. I don't know. I'm not making that claim. Lise and I are trying to develop an alternative concept that may or may not prove useful. But what I like about what I've seen in the news the last three days, and I'll finish on this point, is that NATO now wants to have more presence in Ukraine, it appears, with the idea of having not NATO combat forces, but a NATO political mission and a military liaison mission in Kyiv. And that's the kind of dynamic that I think may provide us an alternative way to ensure that Ukraine is never conquered by Russia in the future, getting the Western presence inside of Ukraine much denser and partly uh, reflected and manifested in military terms. Again, my preference would not necessarily be through a NATO membership, which is not going to happen soon anyway, but there may be other mechanisms by which we can essentially build a dense presence that serves as a tripwire against Russian attack on the center parts of Ukraine, and that just strengthens our long-term relationship. So I see that as potentially interesting, not a huge development on a par with NATO membership, but still potentially a useful way of ensuring that Ukraine will remain sovereign and independent long-term. Thank you, uh, Mike, Mike, for these interesting ideas. Um, I wanna stay with you and go backwards because um, while, as you mentioned, there is all these uh, important developments also in support of Ukraine that NATO is being engaged with, liaison and, and obviously, you know, G7 funds and uh, security guarantees. And, and it is the case that uh, the, the front lines have stabilized, particularly around Kharkiv, the, the Russian assault is, seems to have been uh, stopped. For now, 
But it is also the case that Vladimir Putin seems to have the upper hand psychologically. He, he, he looks comfortable. He looks confident. And the global South, outside of uh, Europe and uh, you know North America, there is this idea that Russia is not losing. Now, you and I were uh, present when we uh, last week when we had a chance to speak to a former official, senior official, who described the, the need to have some sort of a shock effect on the situation, coming up with a policy that would shock, create some sort of a shock in the system so that Putin might be more amenable to, at some future point, to negotiations and ceasefires and so on and so forth. Are you thinking of this new idea in that sense, in, in that framework? That was an interesting comment. And that is perhaps the kind of dynamic that needs to be established to put Putin back on his heels a little bit. I don't know that that is quite as big of a question, however, whether or not such a shock could occur as what happens with European and American politics over the next six months and where we are collectively as an alliance and our willingness to support Ukraine in 2025. My best guess is that, I don't claim to make a guess about what Donald Trump would do as president, but if we get into 2025 and support continues, I think we sort of owe it to Ukraine to take one last serious crack at trying to regain as much of its territory as it can. I don't expect that there will be that much success, but I've been wrong about many things in military analysis in my career, and I know it's an inexact science at best, so I could be wrong again. And I think, therefore, we do owe Ukraine this chance. But then if that doesn't play out very successfully over the spring, summer of 2025, then we're at a crossroads. And as you say, Putin may still be willing to fight for multiple years on end, assuming at that point he can outlast us with or without Trump in the White House. But he may also decide that holding on to whatever fraction of Ukraine he's got at that point, and right now it's about 18 percent of pre-2014 Ukraine, uh, that that's enough especially if you can keep Ukraine out of NATO long term, and maybe you can have a negotiation. I don't know. But I think that's sort of, that's how I expect the next 12 months to play out. And then we'll be at a crossroads where I can better answer your question about the long term. I agree that Putin right now seems to have the upper hand, seems to think he has the upper hand at least. And it would be nice if we could somehow change that psychology, but I'm not sure any one act on the battlefield is going to do it so much as seeing how politics evolve uh, over the next 12 months, and then if and when a Ukrainian counteroffensive is attempted, whether it can really show any success. Tara, uh, I want to ask you about uh, European contributions to defense spending. That's been an evergreen topic at NATO summits, but now we have 20 three allies, 23 NATO members meeting the 2% target. They're not delinquent in the words of Donald Trump. They have a big stake in Europe's defense, but how is it going? Are they are Europeans able to ramp up defense production? Are you uh, are they able to transition to a greater sort of war economy, for lack of a better word? So you're right. They're doing a lot more, even though what's clear now is that the two, you know, the two percent uh, goal of spending in in defense, the two percent of GDP, sorry, uh, in defense spending is is not just a threshold, but it's it's only a ceiling now. Actually, a lot of experts are calling for three or four percent, and we're seeing countries uh, in Eastern Europe, in particular, who are spending actually closer to three or four percent, including of Poland including Poland, absolutely. And so we're seeing, I think, a dynamic towards actually more than 2% because there is a necessity for it now. I think the term war economy is still very much taboo in, in many places in Europe because even though there is war in Europe, um, the European Union, for instance, is not at war with Russia. And so the French president has used it a few times, but a lot of people are, I think, a bit wary of, of using that term, even though it is quite clear that Vladimir Putin is actually has put his own country uh, in war economy. He's spending uh, almost 8% of GDP in, in defense, has totally transformed his industrial base. So he could, you know, Mike, and, and you are absolutely right, he could um, 
spend a lot more time at war with Ukraine until he finally gets what he wants. He has decided to put his his country in, in that situation. We can't, I don't think as Europeans, we can decide that we need to be in a war economy, uh, but we can decide to do a lot more. And I think we've done that already. One one uh, issue that I hope is, I mean, is a pretty nerdy issue, but I hope can bring a bit of a uh, glimmer of hope is reinforced EU-NATO cooperation. I think we have, there are two indications that this might go in, in a much more positive direction right now. First of all, there's an institutional dimension um, with the change at the commission and in terms of institutional leadership inside the European Union, we're seeing Kaya Kalas, uh, right now the head of Estonia, who's going to become the high representative for foreign policy um, at the European Union, very much uh, a NATO girl. She knows NATO very well, but she knows the EU very well, too. Uh, and the new NATO Secretary General, Mark Rutte, formerly uh, Prime Minister of the Netherlands, who also knows the two institutions very well. And what we've seen is a lot of defiance coming from both institutions for the past three decades uh, with a lot of reluctance to work together. I'm hoping that with these two new people uh, at the head, both of EU diplomacy and NATO, uh, we might see a lot more EU-NATO cooperation. And I think that's quite key. Again, with Sweden and Finland, two EU member states having joined NATO now, we really need it. And the second uh, positive aspect that I see is more concrete in a way than the institutional, though leadership and personal relationship, of course, matter in foreign policy. Um, there is actually willingness from the private sector. So two days ago, uh, the European Investment Fund and NATO Venture Capital Fund have announced that they would co-sponsor programs together to ramp up um, the defense industrial basis in Europe. This is another, again, pretty nerdy, but huge taboo that has been broken. Uh, the European Investment Bank didn't want to fund projects linked to defense and security for the past 50 years. It decided to change that and to overthrow um, that decision in January this year. So we're seeing actually European Union institutions and funds willing to, to fund um, uh, defense uh, industrial ramp up. This is something that is of course due to Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine. And so we're seeing, I'm hopeful, between uh, the funding issue that is not totally resolved, but at least a lot more open now and the institutional dimension, I think an opportunity for a lot more co cooperation between the two institutions. But, you know, there are also politics is, is also happening everywhere in Europe. And so we've seen we were warned that that there would be war fatigue um, coming from European populations in terms of support to Ukraine. We haven't seen that in the past two and a half years, but we're seeing government who are claiming war fatigue. And I'm actually more scared of certain governments in Europe right now who are going to look at doing everything they can to undermine support to Ukraine. European populations are quite clear in polls that they still support it very much. But I'm, I'm more fearful of a number of governments who would feel emboldened uh, by what's happening in France, clearly what's happening in Italy, uh, you know, little visibility coming from Germany as well. So I think we're at a moment right now where there's a lot of expectations from the UK. I think if the UK can show direction in terms of leadership, but the UK has also a huge defense industrial base, there is a lot that they could do with the continent. I think we need not just one country, but several European countries coming together and leading that. I think the UK would be key, but of course, the Eastern flank is absolutely key there too. Poland has a huge defense industrial base. So I think we're going to look at a reconfiguration also of, of where leadership comes in uh, when it comes to European security and defense. Sansa, can I ask you to weigh in on the European side of this equation, um, particularly on the debate on Trump-proofing NATO? Now, of course, uh, Brookings is an independent, nonpartisan organization, and we are not uh, taking part in uh, endorsing a candidate in the elections. But Donald Trump, his name, his the possibility of a second Trump administration looms large in any debate on defense and security policy. There's been this idea of Trump proofing NATO. Uh, share us your perspective on what's going on in Europe, whether this is possible, and, and and add to it, please, your impressions from Germany, because you also had a chance to spend some time there. Sure. Well, if, if I may, I'd like to pick up a couple of strands. Um, I am... I'm, I'm, I'm right now, in, frankly, a little bit of a pessimistic mood, although I agree very much with Tara that I think... Um, European politicians generally under underrate the willingness of European publics, from my experience, 
uh, to make sacrifices for for in in this particular situation. I think people understand just how serious this is, and I think they understand because it is so clear that that Putin is locked in a logic of war, of a I mean truly brutal and sadistic war, right? is engaged in lying all the time, right? His troops are committing horrific crimes in the areas of Ukraine that they have occupied. And this is a movie we've seen before, right? We saw it, especially in the, the breakup of Yugoslavia, the, the, war, the genocidal wars that came out of that. And to anybody who's been around a little longer, and that includes me, um, Putin at this point is very reminiscent of um, Milosevic or Saddam Hussein in his in his late years, right? There is very little realistic hope, right, that any sort of stable equilibrium of of uh, armistice or peace is possible with a man who is so obsessed, right, not just with eviscerating Ukraine. Right, with destroying Ukrainian sovereignty, but also with undermining liberal modernity in Europe. Right? I think that that is an, a realization that has really hit home in Europe. Um, what I'm slightly more concerned about is the ability of European governments and institutions to, to rise to the occasion. Um, and, and I think I'm for, for the following reasons. Then it starts with Germany. The, I think the only reason we're not seeing German early elections right now, because the coalition are very, the three members, member parties, members of the German coalition are very unhappy with each other. They have been struggling to get their annual budget um, uh, signed off at the cabinet table. They've had to defer it from last week, um, actually no, from today to in th in two weeks and the only reason why why they're not falling apart uh, at this point is that there is no constitutional legal or political path to early elections unlike in france or britain where calling snap elections is much easier and and constitutionally permissible it's not in germany um, and the other the other thing that that the coalition but also the opposition are deathly afraid of is uh, three state elections in the fall um, where the hard right and the hard left are trending very, very high between 38% and 49% in the polls right now. And of course, they were the winners of the German part of the European Parliament elections a couple of weeks, weeks ago. So what that means, the reason I'm saying all this is that it means that the, the German leadership also is, is fragile and undermined. And in a situation where you have the possibility, as Tara just explained, of a very inward looking France, a new UK prime minister just come on the scene, a very experienced Danish prime minister who's left and being, uh, not Danish, I'm sorry, a Dutch prime minister, and who has been replaced by a new hard right coalition, um, a, an Italian prime minister, Maloney, who is very angry at uh, be having been excluded in the in the negotiations about filling the top positions in the European Commission, um, there is a a lot of political ferment going on in Europe right now. And one last point that I want to make there, and then I'll come to the Trump proving point. But it's important to understand the landscape here. After the European Parliament elections, uh, there were about one hundred and three seats of the seven hundred and two in the Parliament that were not assigned to European, um, uh, to a parliamentary group. And right now it looks as though the hard right is reforming itself on the hard right margins under the leadership of Viktor Orban. And Marine Le Pen might be joining that group. It's not clear whether the AFD will, but depending on where that moves, there could be, um, if worst comes to worst, a, an angry, resentful, and and quite and much stronger than before, hard right group in the European Parliament, which has co decision making powers with the with the executive, and would be would I think be quite willing to throw spanners in the works. And that this brings me to NATO. These European politics don't stop at NATO's door. They do not stop at the door of the North Atlantic Council. It is it would be naive to expect that this doesn't translate 
into into discussions at the at the NAC table, especially in case of a Trumpian win uh, in, in in the U.S. elections in November, right? NATO, so NATO politics aren't Trump proof, and and before that, before that panorama, the the question of whether we can we can organize our defense and deterrence plans, right, and our support for Ukraine in a way that is effective right, against a Russian aggressor is is a very big question mark. And and I am. Like I mean, I'm on the other side of Mike in the in the question of Ukrainian membership. I am I'm not a an, a membership ultra. I'm a pragmatist, but I do think that I, I what I would not like to see is a Ukrainian a, a pseudo a false promise of membership, or a false membership bridge that ends up like Turkey's the promise of of bringing Turkey into the European Union. Asli, I'm sure you will remember that. Right, and and I think that would undermine the credibility of NATO, and it would undermine the security not just of Ukraine but also of um, of Europe. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, it was a great answer, and you you actually took the conversation to uh, where I want to go. Um, first, I will uh, say that we had a number of audience questions from the audience, and you'll be interested to know that. There's been a lot of questions about the meaning of NATO, its vision. What is it good for at this point? These are not anti-NATO questions. They're not coming mm. from sort of a, a, a pro-Russian perspective. But what does it stand for in today's world? Or, you know, should should it should we get rid of it once the war is Ukraine is won uh, by it in favor of Ukraine and replace it with a pan-European security structure? Or should it <laughs> expand to uh, be a security to security style uh, institution for Northeast Asia? Should we include the Middle East and NATO and so on? So I realize that there is a good deal of question that people have in their minds about NATO's purpose. And I will also flag that Jim Goldgeier has an explainer. Yes. What is NATO, which is up on our website it's as part of our explainer series. But uh, Jim, uh, I know you, like uh, Constanza, believe that membership for Ukraine would have been um, a good idea and to deter also Russia. But I want to you to respond to something else. Uh, Robert O'Brien, uh, one of uh, the national security advisor for former President Donald Trump, has written a piece for foreign affairs. And what he says is that Trump, for his part, has made clear that he would like to see a negotiate settlement, negotiated settlement to the war that ends in Ukraine, that is, that ends the killing and preserves the security of Ukraine. His approach would be to continue to provide lethal aid to Ukraine financed by European countries, he notes, while keeping the door open to diplomacy with Russia. He would also push NATO to na rotate ground and air forces to Poland to augment its cap capacities, uh, he says. But it's more the point about negotiations in Russia and how to deal with Russia. Uh, what do you expect would happen if Trump was elected? And uh, if anything, you want to uh, add to the whole membership and endgame debate that Mike and Constanza have uh, started? Sure. Well, I also would like to get, you mentioned some of these questions about what NATO is good for. And, and I think it's all tied together because um, at least to date, uh, the NATO members see their security as intertwined. They see a value in being part of this larger grouping, a military alliance that's there to look out for the security of all the member states and to do it together. Uh, and this is fundamentally a question as to whether Donald Trump believes in that premise. Uh, and I, um, you know, the Robert O'Brien foreign affairs piece um, it seemed to be an attempt to put a coherence uh, on a Trump uh, worldview, but I don't think anybody else speaks for Donald Trump. Uh, and I, I think we don't know uh, whether he will in fact uh, remain um, committed to the alliance. 
Worth noting that the U.S. Congress in last December in the passage of the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, included a provision that a U.S. president can't withdraw from NATO without a two-thirds vote of the U.S. Senate or an act of Congress. This was a bipartisan effort to try to ensure that the United States would remain in NATO. Uh, but the U.S. president uh, is pretty unconstrained in foreign policy. And even without a formal withdrawal, there are lots of things the U.S. can do um, to weaken the alliance. We have seen how important U.S. leadership is. Uh, Mike mentioned how much the Europeans are doing, which is true. But Ukraine was also really dependent on getting that aid package through the Congress, uh, on, on the U.S. getting that aid package through the Congress in March. Uh, because the U.S. has capabilities that the other countries in Europe do not. The United States has played this important leadership role. I think this war has shown how dependent Europe remains on the United States for security against external aggression. And so um, U.S. leadership remains important. But again, so does this idea that our security is intertwined. Um, and um, you mentioned countries in, in uh, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the last several years have seen uh, the heads of state of the so-called IP4, the Pacific Four, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand, participating in the NATO summit because there is increasing recognition that there are connections across these theaters. It's not that these countries uh, in the Indo-Pacific are going to come to the defense of, of NATO countries in Europe or that there's an expectation that Europe would come to their defense if needed in the Indo-Pacific, but that these, these theaters are connected and that U.S., the, these, these alliances of these democracies is important for continued security, especially at a time when Iran and North Korea and China and Russia are increasingly uh, are increasing their cooperation. Russia couldn't prosecute this war without Chinese support. The Chinese are enabling the Russia, Russian economy uh, to, to survive these sanctions. We saw President Putin go to North Korea, uh, a place he hadn't visited uh, in 24 years, and in that at 24 years ago it was a stopover. This was a uh, I need your support, uh, ammunition for this war, um, and um, offered uh, cooperation, uh, technical cooperation in return, and the Iranian support for the war as well. So, um, so. We, we are in this situation where uh, I think we do need to recognize uh, how intertwined our security is with our allies from a U.S. perspective with our allies in both in both the uh, Asia and uh, Indo-Pacific and European theaters. Um, and um, it would be great to have a negotiated solution to this war um, and for the killing to stop. But what kind of negotiated solution and is uh, Vladimir Putin even interested in a serious negotiation. He has given no indication that he is interested in a serious negotiation uh, and a negotiated outcome where Ukraine is being asked to cede the territory that Russia occupies to Russia um, is politically uh, very difficult and would require that Ukraine have a, a, a guarantee uh, that what remains of Ukraine is secure from future Russian aggression. And that's why I support uh, the idea of, of Ukraine joining NATO, particularly as part of a negotiated solution uh, to this war, so that at least what the sovereign Ukraine that remains uh, would be able to have a, uh, uh, would be confident that, um, that Russia would not simply resume its aggression uh, down the road. And I think what we've seen from the United States and Canada and Europe to date is, an, is a recognition that a secure Ukraine is fundamental to the security of Europe, uh, that a Vladimir Putin who just can continue on in the way that he has uh, in seeking to uh, conquer Ukraine uh, is then uh, truly a threat uh, to the rest of Europe as well. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I want to stay on China because, well, Indo-Pacific, because we also have a number of questions about that. The Biden administration has obviously described uh, China as the pacing challenge 
the country with the intent and ability uh, to challenge a rules-based order and has very much been the focus of administration's efforts in, on the security domain. Um, how do we think of China in the context of NATO, in the Pacific, in the context of NATO? And uh, where do you see the dilemma, the issues and dilemmas in this, in this uh, framing? Thanks, Asla. And let me say, uh, Jim's answer was excellent. And I agree with 100% of it with one uh, asterisk about the NATO question. I'm not principally opposed at this point to Ukraine being in NATO. I just don't know what's going to be pragmatic in negotiations. And if an alternative architecture that looks comparably robust can be more negotiable. I just want to preserve that option. That's the that's the way I think about it here in 2024. Uh, but on to China. First of all, you you mentioned earlier that some people are wondering if NATO should extend its purview to East Asia. My sense is no, that it should not extend Article Five to allies in Asia. I think NATO has enough to do, and it's a complicated enough organization with enough members. All NATO countries have to think about China. But it doesn't mean the alliance is the right convening location or institution to develop policy, especially military policy. So my instinct is is to keep NATO focused on Europe and the near abroad. But again, I'll be curious if others might disagree with that. In terms of how we're thinking about China in the United States, more generally right now, I think that there is, at the Pentagon at least, and I think elsewhere in parts of the government, a sense that we are making progress in improving our deterrent and our focus on the Asia Pacific, even as we cope with tragedy and crisis and conflict in Europe and the Middle East. Some of the defense investments that have been made, as the Marine Corps Commandant discussed yesterday at Brookings, are now panning out. It's not just a Biden administration thing, by the way, it's the Trump and Biden administrations, which ironically on this issue have actually had a great deal of continuity at the Pentagon in particular, but maybe even more broadly than that. And, and so there is a sense that through military, but also economic instruments, and especially through tightened alliances in the Indo-Pacific region, that we are in fact shoring up our position, but people are still very nervous. They're very nervous about how China is treating the Philippines in the South China Sea, aggressive actions that have bordered on, that have included actually violent acts that have injured seriously injured Filipinos in recent weeks and that threatened to do so and perhaps even you know lead to loss of life in the future. Obviously, the Taiwan issue remains fraught and China didn't much like the inaugural address by President Lai in Taiwan back in May, although I thought it was pretty reasonable, but China decided to show some objections. So everyone's still nervous and watching very carefully, but feeling like perhaps at least as a government and even as a bipartisan you know, initiative across governments and across different administrations, uh, but it's certainly within the Congress, that we are finding our, sort of finding our feet and developing a grand strategy towards China that has some staying power and some prospects for success. Constanza and Tara, I want to give you an, an opportunity to weigh in on the Indo-Pacific debate since it is pretty much an obsession in Washington. Uh, Tara, do you want to go? Sure. Um, I totally agree with what Mike just said. I think that I think all NATO allies and actually a lot of countries in the world think about China, uh, both as a challenge, as an opportunity. I think in the US, it's mostly as a challenge. And in Europe right now, it's also a more and more seen as a challenge. I think China's support to Russia and its war against Ukraine is now leading Europeans to think of China as um, almost a national or international security issue, which it, it didn't before. It really thought of it as an economic security issue. Uh, but I think we're seeing an evolution from a European perspective still. But Europeans are still very dependent on the Chinese markets. Uh, you know, So I think that they're going to try and find a way to remain both close to the US and diversify away from China, all the while not giving up on the Chinese market for a while, as long as they can, probably, you know, as long as China supports Russia, this very fine balance that the Europeans are working are, is probably not going to be walkable uh, in the near future. But I think NATO is not the place to discuss this. You can discuss 
common challenges, uh, you know, a, a shared assessment of what uh, China's trajectory is right now and what it's doing um, in the Indo-Pacific, how it's affecting American and European allies in Asia. I think that's absolutely key. That's why it's really interesting that for the past three NATO summits, uh, the IP, so-called IP4, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea and Japan have been um, invited to come to the summit because I think they also... Um, they also need to see what NATO discussions on European security and North Atlantic security are. And I'm really struck that both um, Japan and South Korea have supported sanctions against Russia. They've been thinking about how to provide weapons to Ukraine. South Korea has a provision in its constitution that it cannot sell or provide weapons uh, to a conflict zone, an active conflict zone. And the South Koreans are thinking about how to move this or how to circumvent it a little bit because they do see that uh, security in Asia, security in Europe are intertwined, interlinked, and that actually you cannot separate the two theaters right now, especially with uh, uh, a huge China-Russia rapprochement that is not just conjectural, that is, it, it's not going to be a short term. Um, I don't want to call it an alliance because I don't think it is that, but it's a very strong partnership. Um, and so this is a reality that Europeans and Americans will have to face together, I think, with slightly different perspectives. But we'll have to accept both Europeans and, and Americans that even if we have slightly different perspectives, we need to be able to discuss it. So I, I don't think NATO is uh, meant to deal with the Indo-Pacific, but we need to discuss it. And maybe one word on old and bold because I think the questions that we got from the alliance from the audience sorry really pertain to this to this debate uh, and this is the question also that in a way this summit and future NATO summits will have to answer regardless of the US presidential election which is how does it remain co relevant to its core mission which is the defense of the North Atlantic region and how does it remain relevant to today's challenges all the while not superseding or substitute you know subduing one to the other how how do you do both how do you think about them how do you find this common shared assessment of what today's challenges are i think this is where nato will manage to remain relevant and this is why i also agree with what mike said i think the idea of a celebration is makes me really uneasy i understand why we need to mention it but i think with the current context in europe what's really important is about you know, acknowledging everything that NATO has done in the past 75 years and looking at how it can prepare itself for the coming decades. And I think if NATO is able to demonstrate that to the American public, to the European public, then it will have truly won. So Saza, um, let me turn to you. Uh, any aspect of this conversation on in the Pacific and old and bold that you want to share? Any reflection <laughs> as final comments? Can but I have, have a fun question. <laughs> For each panelist to answer, yeah. um, you are invited to the White House gala dinner next week with the head, NATO heads of state, and you get to sit. You get to pick your own table. You can sit next to whoever you want in terms of world leaders. Who do you want to sit next to and what do you want to raise? Is that to me now? That's to you and okay. to everyone else. but. Uh, to you right, very simple um i and i would have a lot to say about the other topics but i won't because of time um i think i'd want to sit next to georgia maloney uh for the simple reason that i would really i would like to engage her in conversation find out what makes her tick um she would be the least predictable most likely to surprise in conversation maybe it would even be fun what do i know certainly not victor orban let me just say that <laughs> I think Georgia Maloney can be a fun dinner partner, it sounds like. But uh, uh, any message you would share with her? Or is it, or would it be your old journalist hat and interview? Look, I, I, I think I would be in listening mode, right? I, um, I, I, don't, I don't feel like, I mean, who knows? Maybe she would be interested in what I have to say about living in Washington as a German, but I, I doubt that. And I think I would not want to waste the time in in trying to tell her things. I would want to learn how she, she, she thinks. That's it. Jim? Yeah, well, I I, I would also say Maloney. And, and the reason is building wow. on what, Const what Constanza said. Well, because it's so interesting. I mean, we thought when she came in, we were worried that how pro-Russian she might be. 
We would never have expected how supportive she would be of, of Ukraine. Um, she has called out Putin recently uh, on his so-called peace plan. Uh, she rightly called it propaganda. I mean, it's nonsense. You know, it's, he's not serious. And she, she, and she is, <laughs> relative to other European leaders, she looks pretty strong. So um, uh, it would be it would be interesting. I would like to talk to her about the need for Ukraine to be able to strike targets in Russia, and would hope that uh, she could come around um, to uh, to support that. Um, uh, it would be an honor to be invited. I would come in from California for the dinner. Uh, if I were allowed to pick a table and it wasn't a round table, uh, I would have to take one of the two left-handed seats. Um, for those of you who never think about that, uh, you, you got to take one of the two corners uh, if you're a lefty, and um, uh, which means I would only have one person to sit next to in that case. Uh, and if Constanza is already sitting next to her, uh, I would probably uh, then want to catch up uh, with... Uh, well, if it's a round table, I'd want to be seated next to another lefty on my on my left side. But uh, uh, but then I'd want to catch up with uh, either uh, uh, Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau, or uh, or Mr. Ruta, because uh, when I was dean at the School of International Service, I uh, was honored to host both of them uh, at SIS. So uh, it, it would be nice to catch up. That's excellent, uh, Mike. Mike. Sorry, clicking my audio back on. Well, since um, Maloney's been spoken for, and since Sana Marine is no longer Prime Minister of Finland, oh, I would I would fall back on President Zelensky, and I would oh, just have you I, get I, to I, pick yeah, the yeah, fun yeah, guy. Yeah. And I would just have one question: Tell me how this ends, and how we can work together to make it end the best way possible, relatively soon. I'm surprised nobody wants to sit next to President Erdogan. But he actually doesn't speak English, so that may be. Uh, and is he any fun at all in conversation? <laughs> I will, I will not comment on it, Constanza. But Tara, who's your, uh, who who do you want on your dance card? Who do you want to sit next to? Well, you won't be surprised if I say Kaya Kellas and Mark Rutte and get them to talk about EU NATO stuff. If, and you know Joe Biden, if. If this is a fantasy dinner, I mean, you know, that doesn't happen many times in your life. If I can sit next to the American president, I wouldn't say no to that. But talk about more, you know, Euro-Atlantic cooperation in the future and look towards the future would be really my my advice. Future for Ukraine, future for Europe, future for the U.S. Thank Hello. you. Well, I do hope, yes, Constanza. I just wanted to say I actually was at a summit dinner once in Prague 2002 because so many delegations had left, they brought in think tankers from a parallel summit. And that was very memorable, not least because of the Czechs have a very, very funky sense of humor. And I saw, and this is, I will never forget this. I saw General um, Wesley, what's his name? Wesley Clark, Wesley Clark. And, Candy, and Candy Rice, Condi Rice, um, crying with laughter, with tears streaming down their faces after the Czech cultural program. I doubt that we're going to see that here, though. Mm -hmm.